this is not a great argument, and no one tries to use that now. But it's still a great argument because of the quality that we have. Good people and smiling people. And I love to see smiling faces. I've said before that in all of this mask mandating that we've been dealing with, that it made me miss seeing people smile. Go to Walmart or somewhere and don't know whether it's happy, smiling, frowning, or what. But anyway, it is so good to see all of you, and I know a lot of folks are sick, and we're sure sorry about that, but and I'm glad and thankful that I'm not, and that you're not, and that we're able to be here. And to those of you <clears throat> who are joining us and watching online, by Facebook or otherwise, we welcome you, and I'm thankful that you could join us, and your presence even electronically is an encouragement to all of us. Well, the last few times that I have been with you in my monthly visit with you, we have studied about getting better acquainted with God and getting better acquainted with Jesus. Presently, we're studying a series of lessons about getting better acquainted with Jesus. And incidentally, because someone did ask, yes, when we finish this, about Jesus, and it'll be two more lessons or one more time, so God willing, in January, we'll conclude the studies about Jesus, and then starting in February, we'll have some lessons about getting better acquainted with the Holy Spirit, and that is always of interest to people, and so I look forward to leading you in that study. I begin this morning by defining two words. I want to define the word define. Defining is, and I read it from the Webster's Dictionary, is to determine or identify the essential qualities of someone. Now, you could be uh, in a situation where you define the qualities of a thing, like a piece of wood and so on. But in our study today, directly, we're talking about Jesus Christ. And so a defining of Jesus Christ is the determination or the, the identification of the essential qualities of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. The second word that I want to define as we begin our study is the word distinction. A distinction as defined by Webster is, it is something that sets apart from others. So it could be again some object, a non-living object that is set apart from the others. But in this case, we're talking about a person. Jesus Christ. And so we're talking about a distinction that sets Jesus apart from others. So you put those two words together to determine, that is to define and determine the qualities that Jesus has that sets him apart from other people. So that's essentially the premise of our study. And the reason that I chose that premise is because of the words written by the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1. So get your Bible. This is Sunday school. This is Bible study. So get your Bible and open it to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to read from that to begin with in our study this morning. When Paul wrote the Christians, the saints, in Colossae, he wrote a lot about Jesus. And he did that in some of his other epistles, like Ephesians. 
although Ephesians also has a great emphasis upon the church and the relationship that the church has to Christ. In this particular epistle or letter, Paul does something that is a defining distinction of Jesus Christ. In fact, in the scriptures that we're about to read, you're going to see eight of those, eight defining distinctions about Jesus. And I know a lot of you take notes, so you can just go ahead and number it down, one through four, four through eight. And I'm going to give you eight things. I will point them out to you as we get to them. Let us begin our reading at verse 13. And the first word is the pronoun he. And this in context is re a reference to Jesus, rather to God, in what he did through Jesus. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed unto us conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now, stop for a second and think about what that conveys to us in words. The King James Version uses the word translated instead of the word conveyed or transferred, as some other translations have it, that God has delivered us, those who are saints. He's delivered us <clears throat> from the power of darkness. Darkness, of course, is used in the scriptures in a way that is synonymous with evil, that which is wicked, in contrast to light, which is synonymous with righteousness and goodness. We, because of our sinfulness, live in a world of darkness until we are converted to Jesus Christ and receive forgiveness, which we'll note in a moment, by the power of God. So again, Paul says he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us or translated us or transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom this is the next verse. In whom? Now that pronoun refers back to Jesus Christ, the Son of God's love. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You know, because you are people who study the Bible, you know that God, before the foundation of the world, planned, he schemed his redemption work through his son, Jesus Christ. We say redemption, that is redeeming, buying back those of us who are created in the image of God, but who have been overtaken in sin, and our sin leaves us in a state of condemnation. God's eternal plan, his perfect plan of redemption, was that he would send his son, Jesus the Christ, to this earth to redeem us from that state of condemnation. Now then, Paul uses a phrase here that is so wonderful. In the last part of verse 14, the forgiveness of sins. And it's all through the blood of Christ, that is, through the sacrificial death of Jesus upon the cross. And because of God's action, that is prompted by his amazing love and his amazing grace, it is possible for those of us who are under the condemnation of sin to have the freedom from that condemnation freedom from the guilt. We've committed the sins, and we know that if we're honest about it. We've committed the sins, but we are freed from the guilt of those sins, 
through the blood of Jesus Christ. So there is the first distinction that Paul draws about Jesus Christ. It's through his death on the cross, through his blood, that we have atonement. We have forgiveness. The wrath of God that hangs over us because of our sins is satisfied and we're no longer under that guilt of sin. There's only one way that we could respond to that and be appropriate. And that's in the way that one of the songs that we just sang says. Through the wonderful love of Jesus. The wonderful love of God the Father and of Jesus. And by that means we have forgiveness. So there's your first distinction. Through Christ, in Christ, we have freedom from the guilt of our sins. But let's read on. Verse 13 again. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God. Now stop reading for a moment. There's the next distinction. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. All right, here's a silly question. When was the last time you saw God? Well, the answer, of course, is never. We can't see God. God is spirit. And he's not flesh and blood like us. So we cannot see him like we can see one another. I didn't see you early this morning, but when we came into this building, we could see one another. We can't see God. But Paul here says that Jesus <clears throat> is the express image. He is the one who is the image of the invisible God. The Hebrew writer, or the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 1.3, uses the words the express image of God. What does that mean? Well, it means this. It means that if you were to look at deity and you were to sum up all of the power that is in deity, you were to, if you were to sum up all of the attributes of the of deity, of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just bring it all together, sum it all up, and you would then conclude what this says is that when Jesus Christ was on this earth in the flesh, remember the incarnation, God in the flesh, God is with us, that's the meaning of the word Emmanuel, when Jesus was here in the flesh, we were seeing the expression of God. If someone were to ask, if God were a man, what would he look like? What would he be like? Well, the answer to that is look at Jesus. You see in Jesus the image, the expression of God. A few weeks ago, I led us in a study from John chapter 1, in which John wrote the epistle saying, he wrote the biography of Christ beginning with the words. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with him. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. But you see, I pointed out to you in that previous study that the word, word, W-O-R-D, refers to Jesus Christ, obviously, as the context would clearly emphasize. And it's simply telling us that 
the Word is God. How so? Well, in our language, in our communication, words are what we use to express an idea, to express some concept that we have. So Jesus is the expression to man of God. And that's what this is. He's the image of God. And incidentally, not only is that distinction due to Christ, but I would add this one. He not only would answer the question when he was God in the flesh, what is God like? But he also illustrated with his perfect life what man is supposed to be like. Because he set the perfect example for us. And we can follow him safely without fear of any problem or anything wrong if we just follow his example in all things. With the same attitudes, with the same devotion to God, with the same love for people, with the same hatred for evil, etc. He's the image of the invisible God. Back to verse 15. The next phrase says, He is the firstborn over all creation. Or as the King James Version says, the firstborn of all creatures, of every creature. Well, let's give just a brief thought to that. It won't take but a moment. Was he the first baby born? Well, of course not. He wasn't the first person born. So in what sense is he the firstborn of all creatures or creation? Well, the answer is, this is not a reference to time. This is a reference to rank, a reference to authority, a reference to importance. Of all babies born, of all human beings that have ever lived or ever will live. Jesus is the firstborn. Firstborn. Do you recall that under the old law, there was a distinction given to the firstborn son of every family? The firstborn. Now it carried with it some prominence. It carried with it some blessings. In fact, when the father died, and he had, we'll say, three sons, the firstborn, when the father's inheritance was divided up, it would be divided up into four parts, and sons number two and three would get one part, son number one would get a double portion, because he was the firstborn. But it also carried with it responsibility of leadership in the family. So there was a distinction that was made about the firstborn in the family and of all the creatures, all creations, Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Now, some of you in this audience have children. Some of you have grandchildren even great-grandchildren. Maybe somebody might have a great-great-grandchild. Those are special people, aren't they? Phyllis and I have, we now have eight great-grandchildren. And I know yours are nice, but ours are better, we think. You know, <laughs> that's just the way we are. But we all think, well, special people. I have people in my life means so much to me and they've been such a great source of encouragement and help to me in many ways and many times but no child no grandchild no great-grandchild no companion in marriage no brother no sister no friend ranks with Jesus We sing about him being our friend. 
we sing about being his friend. And we're grateful to him. We're indebted to him. Because of what he did for us. And who he is. He's the firstborn. There has never been a human being. And there never will be a human being that is of greater importance and significance than Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the scripture. Verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. I referred earlier to John chapter 1. In the gospel according to John in chapter 1, John says that everything was created by him. Not anything was created but what was created by him. God the Father, through Jesus Christ, created all things. And that's emphasized to us, of course, in the very first sentence of the Bible. In the well-known verse, verse of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, Moses wrote, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God there is plural. Work, it, it's a reference to him, his son, his Holy Spirit. And down in verse 26 of Genesis 1, and God said, let us make man in our image. Jesus was a part of that, comprising one part of the Godhead. And here, Paul says it was through him that all things were created. But look at the last part of verse 16. All things were created through him. We've just talked about that. But how about the next three words? And for him. How was it created for him? Well, before the creation of the earth, before the creation of all of this world in which we live, God had that eternal plan, that purpose, that through his son, he would send redemption to fallen sinful man. He knew he was going to create the earth. He knew he was going to create man. Man would be sinful and man would need forgiveness. So God made his plan to do all of that through Jesus. Where? In the creation, including this planet upon which you and I live. And it was created for him. I would even think that that implies to us it was created for the honor and the glory of him. And so, as some of you know, because I send them to you at your request, I send out emails with pictures that let us know how amazing God's creation is. Just look at it around you. And we see so many things that let us know of the amazing power of God. But I would also say that this phrase created for him, it was as if God looking down through time would say, this is what I will do. I will send my son to save fallen man and the stage, so to speak, upon which all of that will take place is earth. The creation of the Son. It was all created by him. Verse 17. And he is 
before all things. And in him all things consist. Okay, he is before all things. Well, that's just simply a reference to the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, as one of the three members of the Godhead, the three people who comprise the Godhead, Jesus pre-existed like the Father, like the Holy Spirit. Thus, we have the words that I've quoted twice. I'll quote them again. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. And He was with God in the beginning. So he, that's what this means. He's before all things. And it's building up to a crescendo that we will see momentarily. But back to verse 17, notice the last phrase, and in him all things consist. You see here we have this further distinction of Jesus Christ, that he's before all things. He's the one who made all things. And in him, <clears throat> excuse me, all things consist. And the word consist there just simply carries the meaning of continuing, continuing to be held together. Peter wrote about this in 2 Peter chapter 3 when he talked about the Lord spoke this world into existence. And by that word, it continues. This world was God's creation by the spoken word. And he spoke and God said, let there be light. God said, let there be. And he created all of the things that are on this earth. He spoke it into existence. How does it all stay together? And how does it maintain the precision that is required of the orbiting? It brings that sun up every morning at the right time place at the right time and that sets at the right time. The forecasters can tell you the precise minute that the sun will rise in the morning. They can tell you the precise minute that it will set. How so? Because God's creation is that precise and constant. And thus God said after the flood there will always be the seasons of the year. It will never stop. It reminds me of one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite cartoons, two old men sitting on a porch, whittling, and they just pouring down rain day after day after day after day, just rain, 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 rain. One of them finally said, well, do you reckon it'll ever stop raining? And the other man said, well, it always has. So see, you, you can know that whatever is there has been around before. As Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. All of that because of the word of the Lord. Now, bringing this back into the context of 2 Peter 3, Peter said, by his word it came into existence, and by his word it's held together. But you go back and read Second Peter 3 and you're going to see Peter saying, but there's going to be a moment coming when God will say, that's it. Time shall be no more. And that which he brought into existence by his word will be destroyed by the same power. Back to our text. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning? The firstborn from the dead. That in all things he may howl the preeminence. Now there are two or three things in this verse. 
First of all, he's the head of the body of the church. This is not the only time the Apostle Paul wrote that. When he wrote the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1, in referring to the action of God the Father, he said that he, that is God the Father, has put all things under his feet. That's the feet of Jesus. He's put all things under his feet and has given him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Then later in that same epistle, in Ephesians 5, 23, he said he's the head of the church. I want you to listen carefully to this. By God's edict, through divine power, through divine authority, God has said, the head of the church is Christ. And there is a needed distinction that needs to be made regarding that. And I make it in these words, and I've made it in these words before, right here at Fairview, about three years ago. And I'm going to repeat it because it needs to be repeated. Brethren, that means the church is His. It belongs to Him. It's His church, not mine not yours. And he sets in the church by his authority elders, leaders, shepherds for the souls to lead the souls to righteousness. But the church doesn't belong to the elders. And the church doesn't belong to the best person you could point out in the church. I know, accommodatively, we, we say, well, at my church or in our church, we do. But always remember, the church is His. He's the head. So when you and I realize who we are, we are members. We're parts. We are those who have been added to the church when we realize who we are as members of the body of Christ, the body of Christ, then immediately remember who the head is. So our behavior, our decisions, our whole lives should be controlled by that realization. But then he looked, look in verse 18, he said, he's the head of the body of the church who is the beginning. Again, that's a reference to his preceding, his pre-existence. And then the next phrase, the firstborn from the dead. Well, when Paul wrote this, Jesus had been raised from the dead. But was he the first human being that was ever raised from the dead? No, of course. John 11, he raised Lazarus while he was here on earth. Matthew 9, he raised the daughter of Jairus. In Luke 7, he raised the son of a widow from Nain. And later in Luke 7, verse 22, he said, and the dead have been raised, implying that there were others that he rose, that he raised rather from the dead. And that this is the means by which it's been done. That is the power that resided in Christ. Do you remember I said, if you took all of the power of deity, all of the attributes, the qualities of deity, they resided in Jesus when he was God on earth in the flesh. Here's the crescendo. The last phrase of verse 18 that in all things he might have the preeminence. 
That word preeminence is interesting and it's significant. The New American Standard Version translates that this way, that he might have first place in everything. The New International Version says, in everything he might have supremacy. Well, that's a hot word in our society today, isn't it? All this talk about white supremacists. The Lord steps in and says, let me tell you who has the supremacy. Jesus. In all things, he's the supreme one. In everything, he's number one. And Paul just thereby finished building this case of these eight distinctions of Jesus Christ that in all things we would see him as the firstborn, the most important, number one. Listen carefully to my last sentence. God has made him so God has declared him so. But unless you and I make him number one in our lives, it doesn't matter to you personally. In our lives, it will not matter. That's the challenge that faces us and the privilege that we have of being his disciples. Thank you for your wonderful attention.